Good to know you're still with us. You're watching The Breakfast on Plus TV Africa. Now, as we progress uh, the conversation on COVID-19, we recognize that there are survivors who have come out stronger and better. Although there is a need to take seriously the reality of COVID-19, it is important to remember that it is not a death sentence. On that note, we have survivors of COVID-19 on this segment to share their journey to recovery. From Lagos, we have Yemisi Daudi join us. Good morning, Yemisi. Good morning. We also have joining us from Accra, Ghana, Fred Smith. Good morning, Fred. Hi, good morning to you, Felicity. Thank you both uh, for joining us. I, I think we also have uh, Abdallah El Kurebe. Uh, can you hear me? Good morning. I can hear you. Good morning. Good morning. It's a pleasure to have you all join us. Um, congratulations on your surviving uh, COVID-19. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Let's start thank you. with you, Yemisi. Even though we, you have long recovered from COVID-19, could you take us through that moment when you were told you had the virus? What went through your mind? Well, I think, um, like I said before, I had... Um, prepared myself basically I had um I wasn't in denial as soon as I got um I had symptoms I did not um I was not in denial that it couldn't it couldn't be COVID in fact COVID was my first thought so I got myself tested but before my results came out I had already started taking medication and um I, I, I so when my results came and it was positive I was not scared. I was not shocked because by that time I had lost my taste buds. I had, um, my sense of smell had gone and that was the major thing for me. And then I became breathless later, but I wasn't scared. In, you know, and that's so unusual for me to remain calm, but I was calm. So aside from the shortness of breath and the loss of the, uh, loss of the sense of uh, smell and taste, were there other things that, you know, bothered you uh, during uh, the time you had the virus? Well, other symptoms that I had, um, I had severe headache. I, the kind of headache that it was like I should cut off all my hair. It was that bad. Then I had um, a lot of body aches serious body ache mm -hmm. but i didn't have a high temperature i didn't have any temperature um i didn't have um a cough and um and that was it basically but i you, had you, other, you were among were the, other the lucky I ones had. then you, you were along among the really lucky ones let's go to fred um you're a popular journalist uh, in your area how did you manage your own situation and what was the impression when somebody of your standing uh was said to have um gotten uh, i mean gotten infected with a virus well thank you felicity first of all uh, I, I was expecting to contract COVID at some point because I was doing a lot of the COVID reporting. So I'm moving from hospital to the airport and to places where COVID patients were. So I took a test with my wife and hoping that it would turn out negative. Yes, indeed, that was negative. But just a week after that, my employer said we're going to do compulsory testing for all staff at Joy FM, and so uh, I had to take the test as well. At this time, I thought I was not going to contract COVID, so I was free from it. Only for my results to come 10 days later, and it turned out to be positive. And I had a call uh, whilst producing the news, and uh, I had to abandon the production and, uh, you know, get someone to continue for me. Then yeah. I sat in my car thinking what I was going to do because isolation centers were full at the time. Uh, what was I going to do? And I was asymptomatic as well. Okay. But I decided to go home and uh, be with my family. Then immediately I announced on social media that I had contracted uh, COVID. And because of that, I was isolating I did the isolation at home, and even though I have my family there, uh, I, I successfully mm. did so, and none of them contracted it as well. Uh, what uh, did you, I mean, w did you, like, 
affect, infect any one of your colleagues? Did they get um, the infection from you uh, since you weren't um, uh, showing any symptoms? Well, a number of my colleagues tested positive, but I'm not sure if I pass it on mm -hmm. to them or they pass it on to me. <laughs> uh, all I know is that a number of them had it. In fact, two persons I went to the testing center with all came out positive. So, uh, you know, the nature of this infection is such that before you get to know you, you have it, it would have been some time and it would be difficult to track where you, you actually got it. All right, I I'm sure your colleagues all recovered from it. Uh, could you repeat that? I said, I'm sure your colleagues recovered, did they? They all recovered from the virus, right? Yes, indeed. In fact, all my colleagues recovered, uh, about 10 of them all recovered from COVID. All right, let's come to you, Abdallah. Like other survivors, you conquered the virus. What was the healing and recovery process like for you? Abdallah, can you hear me? Okay, I think we're having an issue with uh, Abdallah's connection. We'll go to uh, Yemisi. Uh, you participated in one of our promos on uh, stopping stigmatization against uh, survivors. I'm wondering whether you had any experience of stigmatization uh, and whereas there are still people in Nigeria who would not speak about uh, contracting the virus, you chose to come out. So the question is uh, in two uh, phases. What motivated you to do that? And did you have stigmatization? Mm. Yeah, Missy, can you hear me? I haven't anybody the opportunity to stigmatize me personally because um, I am actually too scared to get reinfected. So I'm observing all the protocols, not permitting people to come and visit me. And I'm not visiting anybody, so you can't tell me I can't come to your house because I'm not able to give you that opportunity in the first place. So um, I haven't personally experienced it. The only time that I felt a bit funny about it was actually when I was in the hospital. I was actually in the isolation center. And when the, um, when the like, cleaners when they want to pass something over to you they you know they pass it to you like you have one that like a big disease and that made me feel funny but i don't blame them because they don't want to catch it so but apart from that i haven't really experienced any <laughs> any form of stigmatization now i haven't so what motivated you to come public with it um uh, some people like i said um, would be hesitant it's supposed to be something private it's your health you want to get better and mind your business but you came out what 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 motivated you to do that okay i guess um a lot of um people on different um, groups that I belong to were actually talking about how it's not true. There's no um, COVID in Nigeria and the government are just making up all these figures that there's nobody in the isolation centers. And there I was in the isolation center and I'm wondering that. And then I also had lost a few people that I knew. And I just realized that people were not believing that COVID existed. So I had to come out and tell them that, hey, guys, be serious about this thing because I have just come out of the isolation, isolation center. Because when I now came out, I started talking about it. I started telling people that it's real. And, you know, it's, it's amazing that even the so-called educated people are actually the worst. Because it was after I started talking about it, I started um, telling my story that people started taking it seriously. And some of, the pe some of my friends that were actually going through symptoms and they were hiding it. They were now asking me where could they get tested and mm. everything. I realized that a lot of people are scared of the self more than COVID. And, you know, by talking about it, by telling them that it's not that bad, it's not painful, you know, and just generally share my experience. I realized that you know, it has helped a lot of people. Even some of my friends that um, contracted um, the virus after me, you know, they said, oh, my story was helpful. And I, I still get people that call me for advice and, you know, this is what I went through, what should I do, and all that. And I'm very happy to help if I can save just one person's life. 
That, okay that, for that's, me. Uh, that's very encouraging uh, to know uh, that um, people uh, were encouraged by your story. Uh, I'm told we have Abdullah join us via phone now, so let's try and bring him um, into the conversation. Um, Abdullah, you are among the survivors. I mean, it's uh, something of joy uh, in spite of the fact that we are in an a pandemic. What was yeah. the healing uh, or recovery process like for you, Abdallah? Uh, yeah, for me, it came not as a surprise. And as a journalist, I was, I was sure I could, I, could, I could contract the virus. But all, all the way through, I was asymptomatic. And uh, on my own, I just went for, for the test because I felt at the point that... Uh, I had mingled with those that had contracted it, and I felt I should go for the test. Only for me uh, to get a call from the doctor at the isolation center that I tested positive. And uh, for the 10 days I stayed at the isolation center, I had no, 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 no I, I was okay, I was strong, I was, like I said, traumatic. All right, I, I want to stay with you, and um, I had a conversation earlier on The Breakfast with um, some medical experts who also shared their thought on the seeming growing skepticism and non-compliance to safety protocols. When you hear people uh, talk about the fact they believe there is no COVID-19, it's a hoax and all of that, what do you say to them? Oh, uh, really, we society, especially where, um, uh, where uh, people that don't actually believe uh, COVID exists, people think uh, it is just a ploy to, to, to eat money, uh, I mean, like for money, uh, governments are only lying about it, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, you will also be surprised to, to know that even those, among those that are educated, very many don't hear uh, all the way through in Sokoto, for example, where at the peak of it, markets were open, boxes were, were going to the mosque and churches and, and so on. And very many people were not actually observing the, the, the protocol and there was less government uh, intervention in this. Uh, probably because uh, uh, government itself had virtually uh, uh, no, uh, were with us or tell uh, what was happening. Uh, that brought about uh, serious community uh, transmission. And the first case, Kota was a medical doctor, and and this again uh, should have heightened the fear in, in in the minds of people about COVID. But no, uh, it did not. All right, let's come back to you, Fred. Yours um, is a story of support and encouragement from friends and colleagues. I, I, I wonder if you saw someone who had a severe case of infection and what were some of the things you observed? Well, a colleague of mine, uh, one of them who was symptomatic, uh, he was admitted to a treatment center. Uh, he was... Uh, actually on a ventilator at some point. Uh, he had underlying conditions as well. Uh, his situation wasn't that good until, uh, I mean, God intervened. Uh, he also recovered eventually. Uh, what happened was that his breathing was very difficult, as uh, we've known this, uh, this virus to cause. And he had a lot of headache uh, most of the time. And he also uh, was having issues uh, with his BP. And so that, that's what he went through, but uh, he was able to, uh, you know, recover from this. All right, yeah, see, uh, reports have shown that those who were once infected and recovered can be reinfected if they get exposed again. What extra safety measures have you been uh, following aside from, you know, keeping people away from your home? Well, um, I one of the things I've started doing, or I'd started doing during the lockdown was number one, exercises. I started exercising because I've been told that it will help me, you know, with my immunity as well. I make sure that um, anytime I'm going out, 
although I don't go out that often, I make sure I wear my mask. I don't just wear a mask, I wear a shield as well. If I can wear um, a PPE suit, I would. <laughs> That's how worried I am that getting be infected. And I just generally observe all the protocols. When I go out and I come in, I make sure I quickly wash my face. I gargle with salt water. I take a shower. And um, just generally, and then I still continue. When I, um, if I feel any slight at sore throat, I also... Um, I still take all those um, herbal concoctions or made with, from fruits because I'm asthmatic. So I can't really afford a second, you know, a second um, infection. So I, um, I know pineapple, um, the back of the pineapple and ginger, when I boil it, I drink the water. I've known that it's good for asthma anyway. So I take that, but I don't take it all, you know, like every day because like most things, when you over, you know, take them that when you actually need them it won't work for you so i those are the sort of i just make sure i keep social distancing any workers that have to come into my house like i'm um, a carpenter and if i have a um, sink outside so you wash your hands give your hand sanitizer and while you're in my house you must wear your mask fantastic and, you know i can only try my best and leave the exactly. Uh, you're doing all that is necessary and advised. Um, let, let's come back to you, Fred. Uh, let's talk about this issue of distrust. Um, it, it's obvious in Nigeria we see people not really trusting uh, the leadership um, in managing the affairs, um, the issues around uh, the pandemic. What is the situation in Ghana? Is there an issue of trust deficit uh, between the people mm. and the government? And what role is the media playing and the government in correcting that? Well, the situation is not too different uh, from what's happening in Nigeria, uh, because at the start of this pandemic, government didn't want people to uh, get the information through the media. Uh, government always wanted to say it, but you always find the media going ahead of government to report uh, the cases that we are rec recording and the conditions of those who were reporting. And I, I recall that my, my radio station, for instance, will always start the news with the update on the COVID situation and some survivors or people who have perished. Uh, government was very uh, uncomfortable with that and, you know, uh, discouraged us from doing it. We stopped and people stopped fearing COVID. And so they went back, not wearing the face mask, observing the protocols. And now we've been asked to come back. So the mistrust that existed, I would say at this point, is reducing, but it is the challenge has to do with the people not following the protocols. And I've had to go out myself to, to town after my recovery to ask people why they were not wearing, especially in the markets and lorry parks where lots of people were gathered. Why are you not using your face mask? Why are you uh, not observing the social distancing protocol? And uh, then they questioned whether the virus actually exists. Then I tell them, yes, I, I got one and I've just recovered. That's when people start to set up and say, wow, is that the case? So I think when we tell individual stories or stories of people who have actually going through this, uh, the, the rest of the population will take us serious and then observe it. But I would say the media has done a fantastic work, not just in Ghana, but across the sub-region. And I'm sure it is because of this that we're, we're not recording as many cases as we've seen in other uh, parts of the world. Fred, thank you for all that you do for your people in Ghana. I will come to you, Abdallah. Uh, what would you recommend Nigerians do at this point to remind ourselves that COVID-19 is real and take real responsibility beyond the lip service? Yeah, uh, COVID-19 and uh, the, the, this, uh, the journalists, the media have a very big responsibility in enlightening the people about the reality of it. Especially for us who were tested positive and uh, are now survivors, we have very good stories to tell. Uh, my isolation experience which has been published and is online. Uh, we will see uh, date 
uh, uh, just the account of, of what happened in the isolation center, which means, yes, COVID is real, and because it is global, it is real. There has never been any lie about any disease that is as global as this uh, uh, that I can remember. So that that it is happening in the U.S., it is happening in Russia, it is happening globally. Yes, it is. Uh, the African culture is not that uh, until somebody dies of a disease in your house, you will not agree it exists. But in reality, COVID exists, and we have so much to do to ensure uh, uh, that people actually agree it does. But there is an issue also on the part of why uh, COVID went viral is because uh, I think uh, NCDC uh, uh, is not doing so much, especially in the area of uh, contact risk, uh, because like in my case, until I was discharged, uh, my contacts were not contacted, or I was contacted to give the list of those I knew I had uh, contact with until I was discharged. So you can see why community transmission continued to, 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 to go viral. And until now, in some states, tests, tests again are uh, be, being carried out. So, uh, and this is why states are recording uh, zero cases virtually for months, for one month, for two months. This is not possible if, if contacts are being traced and tested. I, I think this cannot happen. So, well, Nigerian government should be so serious about this because uh, uh, community transmission has gone so so deep, and uh, no 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 much is being done by by, by government, especially and NCDC, to go to the community to test people. So I, I, my, my takeaway uh, from uh, your submission is an increased personal uh, responsibility, sense of responsibility, if we are to really make headway um, in staying safe and preventing the spread of the virus. Thank you very much, Abdallah, for uh, your contribution this morning. Thank you. And of course, I thank you very much, Yemisi Daudu, um, also a survivor of COVID-19, and Fred Smith, all the way from Ghana. Thank you both uh, for your time as well. Thank you. And remember to stay thank safe. You. Keep staying safe. Don't get reinfected, okay? <laughs> <laughs> All right, now, the breakfast will continue after this break. Don't go away.